So the story I have for you tonight, um, <laughs> this is <laughs> it's funny. Well, at least I think it's funny. There was a fella, uh, true story, and um, well, let's just say the speed limit written in his heart might be different than the speed limit that's written on a sign. And so he probably wasn't doing any more than the speed limit in his heart, but he was doing more than the speed limit on the sign. And so he got pulled over. And the officer was very kind and, and you know, said X, Y, Z, and the fellow said something other back. And the guy goes, well, uh, you know, I'm just going to let you off with a warning this time, but slow it down. The guy said, thank you so much. Yes, of course. Thank you. You're very kind. You're very gracious. Okay. One week later, the speed limit in his heart and the speed limit on the sign again were different. He was going too fast. He got pulled over. He rolls his window down a little bit, and the officer said, I told you last week, <laughs> same officer, same guy, he got a ticket. I mean, of course he got a ticket. It's just, it's, it's comical, and yet it's horrible. Because this fella, um, there might have been remorse, but he was just, most upset that he got caught, not that he was doing wrong. Tonight, in Zephaniah, <laughs> God has, is going to tell Judah, uh, you've just been remorseful, you've not been repentant, and I've had enough. And so God is going to come in through Zephaniah. Three chapters, but punchy <laughs> chapters. I hope you got to read them. God is going to um, have one of those sort of father-son talks that my dad would have with me every once in a while <laughs> uh, that you remember forever. Yeah, he didn't yell and scream. It was just, oh. Here's what it is, son, and that's what God does. He lays out the case uh, against Judah. Now, remember, Israel's gone. Israel's already been deported by the Assyrians. Who's at the doorstep? The Babylonians. God is going to use them to execute judgment on Judah. And right now, uh, they don't quite see it, and they're not really quite sure that it's going to happen. Well, God tonight is going to make it very clear that he means what he says, and it's going to happen. So let's look at uh, Zephaniah tonight. The Times, Nahum has just announced Nineveh's impending judgment, and that occurs in 612, so just a little bit before this. Hezekiah's son, Manasseh, and grandson, Ammon have just finished their back-to-back -back wicked 57-year rule, almost 60 years, two wicked guys on the throne in Judah. They've willingly been Assyria's loyal vassal. Remember the Suzerain Vassal Treaty? So there's the, um, uh, there's the king, and then there's his servants. There's the vassal, and there's the or there's the suzerain and there's the vassals. And Judah has been playing that role of a vassal to the suzerain Assyria. They've adopted Assyria's ways and worship. Remember we looked at even one king who visited, said, make me one of those idols that he saw there. They've essentially hung Damocles' sword over Judah. Damocles' sword, you know, the one that swings back and forth and it goes lower and lower and lower. 
yeah, you can Google it later if you don't if you don't know what that is. It's called Damocles sword. But they've hung one of those over Judah essentially in these 60 years. Now Josiah the reformer has come to Judah's throne implementing sweeping spiritual changes in accordance with the newly rediscovered word of God. Amazing. Josiah is eight when he takes the throne. At 16, he devotes himself to follow the Lord. At 16, I was too excited about getting my driver's license. And at 20, 20, he begins his great reforms in Judah. And the Lord seems to have slowed down the process a little bit because of Josiah's reforms. And one of the things in chapter 2, the Lord calls them to continued repentance because Josiah has enacted these changes. And he even says, who knows, maybe I'll relent if you keep going in the direction you, Josiah has turned you. So Josiah, the boy king, has come to the throne, is beginning to do some good things. But while Josiah's reforms are changing the outward appearance of the kingdom, they're not penetrating deep into the people's hearts. Judah's repentance is only skin deep. So Zephaniah is sent to warn and to beg Judah to change in the hopes that God will relent from the Babylonian thing that's hanging right over their head. So Zephaniah, you might have noticed this, he uses the day or a day of the Lord quite a bit. In fact, Zephaniah and Zechariah, many people, Zechariah is coming, we haven't got to Zechariah yet, but the minor prophet Zephaniah and the minor prophet Zechariah in certain ways resemble the book of the Revelation in the New Testament because they're talking about some very similar things. It's very interesting. So Zephaniah, the day, and this particular the day, or you could say a day, is when the Babylonians come. And the Babylonians will come, and this will be on the final, so you might want to write this down. The Babylonians will come three times, 605 B.C., and then they come back in 596 and then they finally come back in 586, 585, and that's it. So 605, they take some people with them, Daniel being one of them. So the book of Daniel begins when he is deported to Babylon. We're coming up on that. That's going to happen in 605. We're, at May, we're somewhere around 640 to Mm, 610 right now. So 605 is just around the corner. That'll be the first time the Babylonians come knocking. So the day for Judah is just around the corner. Um, if you have put away your um, pre-exilic kings and prophets, remember to get that back out. Um, on the final, you'll just have to fill in all the dates and names. <laughs> but you can see way off to the right in 640, you can see Josiah, and he reigned 31 years. And if you'll let your eyes drop straight down, you'll see we just did Nahum and then Zephaniah. So Zephaniah is the minor prophet who is connected with Josiah, as is Jeremiah. And we'll start Jeremiah next week. So again, you can see the kings and the prophets that are speaking into their situation on a timeline. Uh, always very helpful for me. And then you can see these last four guys um, go pretty quickly. So Josiah is the last good, basically good king um, who's trying to make reforms, who's trying to turn the tide in the country, but Judah's having none of it. 
Zephaniah's name means the Lord hides. He's writing probably somewhere between 640 and 621 B.C. He's writing primarily to Judah and Jerusalem. And his purpose was to announce coming judgment on Judah in the day of the Lord. However, he said that judgment would extend to all the nations of the earth indicating that the day of the Lord would also bring deliverance for Israel and the Gentiles. So what's being referred to here as a day of the Lord or the day of the Lord, you could think of sort of like um, the part of an iceberg you could see. There's another part under the water that you can't see until the New Testament. And then God makes it a little more plain. The iceberg I don't know, kind of comes out of the water a little more. <laughs> so you get to see more of the iceberg. But if you read Zephaniah, you're thinking, wow, there is some really similar sounding stuff to Revelation in here, and you would be correct. So this is why Zephaniah is writing. Uh, my little bottom line for tonight is repentance is known by new obedience. Um, this fellow who is driving too fast, not for his own heart, <laughs> but by the speed limit signs, repentance would have meant he didn't speed anymore. Now, ideally, that would be ever, but <laughs> repentance would be he's, he's really asking the Lord's help, and he's trying to not speed anymore. Obviously, that was not the case with this fella. He was just remorseful that he got caught. He was happy he got let off the hook, but his repentance was only skin deep. Once he was out of trouble, I go back to living according to my heart, and I drive fast, or at least faster than the signs allowed. So repentance is known by new obedience, obviously in basically the opposite direction. So the book breaks down pretty pretty simply um, there's going to be a day of judgment, and then there's going to be a day of joy. And so that's basically how the book is going to break down. And so he begins in chapter 1 describing a coming day of judgment. So verse 1, the Lord gave this message to Zephaniah when Josiah, son of Ammon, was king of Judah. Zephaniah was the son of Cushai, son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah. Um, some have speculated that he could be royalty. He could be a son of Hezekiah. It's also possible he just had that name. We don't know. Listen to how he begins because there's an image that should be coming to your mind in these first few verses. I will sweep away everything from the face of the earth, says the Lord. I will sweep away people and animals alike. I will sweep away the birds of the sky and the fish in the sea. I will reduce the wicked to heaps of rubble, and I will wipe humanity from the face of the earth, says the Lord. In these opening verses... God says, there is a coming day of judgment against the whole world, and you're meant to think, ooh, this sounds a lot like flood language, because that's what's intended. That's how uh, widespread this judgment will be. He goes on then in verse 4 through a little way into chapter 2. And he says, he's telling him through verse 4 what he's going to do. And then starting in verse 5, he says why he's going to do this. For they go up to their roofs and bow down to the sun, moon, and stars. They claim to follow the Lord, but then they worship Molech too. And I will destroy those who used to worship me but now no longer do. They no longer ask for the Lord's guidance or seek my blessings. Stand in silence in the presence of the sovereign Lord 
For the awesome day of the Lord's judgment is near. Verse 8, on that day of judgment. Verse 10, on that day. And uh, verse 12, I will search with lanterns in Jerusalem's darkest corners to punish those who sit complacent in their sins. Verse 14, that terrible day of the Lord is near. Verse 15, it will be a day when the Lord's anger is poured out. Verse 18, on that day, the Lord's anger, he goes on. So the, the day of the Lord imagery is filling this book. It's going to begin with God's people. They have special revelation, which brings additional responsibility and judgment. Judah will be judged for her syncretism, so her mixing. I worship the Lord and I worship other pretend gods and idols. She'll be judged for her heartless religiosity. But he says in chapter 2, Gather together, yes, gather together, you shameless nation. Gather before judgment begins, before your time to repent is blown away like chaff. Act now before the fierce fury of the Lord falls and the terrible day of the Lord's anger begins. Seek the Lord, all who are humble, and follow his commands. Seek to do what is right and to live humbly. Perhaps even yet the Lord will protect you, protect you from his anger on that day of destruction. So he calls them to repentance or to a continuing repentance or to a heartfelt repentance. So he says there's a coming day of judgment. It's going to be against the whole entire world, and it's going to begin with God's people. He goes on in chapter 2, beginning in 4, and he starts listing off the Gentile nations that it's also going to hit. Gaza and Eshkelon will be abandoned. Ashdod and Ekron torn down. End of uh, verse 5, the Lord will destroy you until not one of you is left. Uh, and then he says in verse, uh, then he says, the Philistine coast will become a wilderness pasture. And the remnant of the tribe of Judah will pasture there. They will rest at night in the abandoned houses in Ashkelon. For the Lord their God will visit his people in kindness and restore their prosperity again. I've heard the taunts of the Moabites and the insults of the Ammonites mocking my people and invading their borders. Moab and Ammon will be destroyed. Destroyed as completely as Sodom and Gomorrah. He's going to make it a desert, basically. Uh, the nations, verse 11, the nations around the world will worship the Lord, each in his own land. So after he judges and he is kind to a remnant, it will result in worship to him. He keeps going. He talks about the Ethiopians. So now he's in the north part of Africa. Uh, he said, they'll be slaughtered by my sword, and the Lord will strike the lands of the north with his fist, destroying the land of Assyria, which he did in 612. He wiped it out with the Babylonians and the Medes. So he's going to... Um, execute judgment on all the surrounding Gentile nations. Uh, to the west, Philistia. To the east, Moab and Ammon. To the south, Egypt and Ethiopia. To the north, Assyria. Why is he going to do this? For your oppression of his people, born of arrogance. For an indifferent, complacent, carefree attitude. And for your prideful self-sufficiency. He's talking to all the Gentile nations around Judah. It's going to be against the whole world. It's going to begin with God's people. It's going to spread to the Gentile nations. And it's even going to consume Jerusalem. And he starts talking about that in chapter 3. 
verse 1 of chapter 3. What sorrow awaits rebellious, polluted Jerusalem, the city of violence and crime. No one can tell it anything. It refuses all correction. It does not trust in the Lord or draw near to its God. Uh, Lack of humility in God's people, something he takes note of. Humility even to be um, corrected. No one can tell it anything. It doesn't trust in the Lord or draw near to its God. Its leaders are like roaring lions. Its judges like ravenous wolves. Prophets are arrogant liars. Priests defile the temple. But the Lord is still there in the city, and he does no wrong. Day by day, he hands down justice, and he does not fail. But the wicked know no shame. He says, I've wiped out many nations, devastating their fortress walls and towers. Their streets are now deserted. Their cities lie in silent ruin. There are no survivors, none at all. I thought, says the Lord, surely they will have reverence for me now. Surely they will listen to my warnings. Then I won't need to strike again, destroying their homes. But no, they get up early to continue their evil deeds. Therefore, be patient, says the Lord. And he goes on and continues to talk. Verse 9, then I will purify the speech of all people so that everyone can worship the Lord together. On that day, you will no longer need to be ashamed. Those who are left will be the lowly and the humble. For it is they who trust in the name of the Lord. Jerusalem will be consumed for harboring oppressors who disregard people's rights, for harboring rebels who refuse to submit, for harboring defilers who are polluted by sinful influences and practices. The holy city is unholy, and God has had enough. Some lessons for Judah. God isn't fooled by appearances, by your superficial repentance, Judah. As the Holy One, God will judge sin. As my favorite late 1800s preacher said, Charles Spurgeon, God will not let his children sin successfully. Maybe some of you have seen this. It's called the monkey trap. How do you catch a monkey? Well, you put something the monkey wants inside of this coconut or this gourd. And you make the hole just big enough for the monkey to get his fist in it. And as soon as he grabs something that he wants at the bottom, he's trapped. He can't get his hand back out of the gourd or the coconut. All he would have to do (laughs) is let go of whatever it was he wanted in the gourd. That's all he would have to do. He could pull his hand back out. But he so wants what's in that gourd, he is not going to let it go, and therefore he becomes trapped. Trapped by, if you will, his own sin. What he wants more than freedom is this thing at the bottom of the gourd. It's called a monkey trap. God telling Judah, when the sinner won't offer himself to God as a living sacrifice, he'll become the sacrifice for and victim of his own sin. 
undoubtedly Judah rationalized or justified their choice to hold on to their sin. Don't know all the things that might have been in, the, in that day. But all they had to do, all God's asking them to do is let go. Just let go of it and you'll be free. But if you don't let go of it, it's not going to go well for you. And God through Zephaniah is telling Judah, you won't let go of the sins that I'm telling you to let go of and so you're trapped. All you have to do is open your hand. But if you don't want to, it's more like Burger King. Have it your way. You want to be trapped by your sin? Okay. Judah is trapped. And so then God turns in verse 9, and I started reading those already. He says he'll purify the speech of all the people so that everyone can worship the Lord together. My scattered people who live beyond the rivers of Ethiopia will come to present their offerings. On that day, you will no longer need to be ashamed, for you will no longer be rebels against me. I will remove all proud and arrogant people from among you. There will be no more haughtiness on my holy mountain. Those who are left will be the lowly and humble, for it is they who trust in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel will do no wrong. They will never tell lies or deceive one another. They will eat and sleep in safety, and no one will make them afraid. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. For the Lord will remove his hand of judgment and will disperse the armies of your enemy. And the Lord himself, the king of Israel, will live among you. At last your troubles will be over and you will never again fear disaster. On that day, meaning 16, 17, for the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty savior. He will take delight in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. Verse 20, on that day, I will gather you together and bring you home again. I will give you a good name, a name of distinction among all the nations of the earth as I restore your fortunes before their very eyes. I, the Lord, have spoken. A day of judgment. But the Lord also says it will be a day of joy because he's not leading them to Babylon to leave them in Babylon. They will return. Israel will turn to him. He will come for them. The remnant will return to the promised land. They will be restored. Their fortunes will be reversed. And they will rejoice. We've talked about this before in all the minor prophets. Certainly there is a remnant in Judah who is faithful to the Lord, like a Zephaniah, like a Jeremiah, who will experience the downside of the rest of the people. God is encouraging the remnant, I'm coming for you. Don't worry about it. You're mine, and I'll come get you. So he, he, he's warning the disobedient, but he's also encouraging the faithful. This day of the Lord will have two sides to it, if you will, a dark side of judgment and then a light side of rejoicing. Well, what lessons might Zephaniah want for Judah? God will not always be angry with you. 
He will turn toward you again. There will be healing and restoration. Now, there's a great verse for you to uh, memorize, Numbers 23, 19, and 20. Some of you might already know that. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he spoken? Has he promised and not fulfilled? Has he spoken and not acted? It's a great set of verses. When you read a promise in the Bible, has he promised and not fulfilled? Has he? His own reputation and name is on the line. He will not. That's why he says we can trust him for these things. He's made promises in here to Judah and to basically to a regathered Israel. I'll suggest to you we have not seen these things yet. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. What does that mean? It means it's coming. When? Don't know. But it's coming. I love this. There's two places where it says, and the Lord himself, the king of Israel, will live among you. And then he, that was in 15 and then in 17. For the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty savior. Good stuff. His chastening is only for a little while. For your purification and holiness, Judah. One day, the whole earth will recognize and worship God for how he's dealt with you. One day, God says, my people will be a blessing to the entire world. Does that sound familiar? Should Abrahamic covenant, what will God do? I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. Oh, you didn't think we'd ever have to do the Abrahamic covenant again, right? And you've forgotten it. What did it promise? Three things. Land, seed, and blessing. And there are three U's to describe the covenant. It was unilateral, meaning it came from God, down. Unconditional, meaning no if-then. And unending. Go to the head of the class. Unending. Are we still in unending right now? Yes. These things have yet to happen. One day, God says, my people will be a blessing to the entire world. Great short little book talking about the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord, the Lord will begin in with his own people. And he will begin by chastening them, disciplining them. You can fast forward to the book of the Revelation and you can see that. You might call that the second half of the tribulation. Then he will attack the Gentile nations. And you might say that that comes next in the book of the Revelation. And then the Lord himself comes to be with his people and to declare an end and peace and safety. And that might be the end of the book of the Revelation. It's all the same. Way back here, 600 B.C., Pretty amazing. By the way, Zephaniah and John didn't know each other. But the Holy Spirit was in common and led them both to write of the same things. God. Don't love this more than you love Jesus, but love this second, because this is amazing. Well, let's talk about a couple lessons for us. First, there's a warning for those of us who have become mm, a little calloused or a little complacent uh, toward holiness or toward one or more particular sins. Um, 
that warning is the Lord sees superficial repentance. Superficial repentance loves remorse and religiosity. So I got caught. I'd better do four things to make up for it. Maybe that's not familiar to you. Maybe it's just me. Superficial repentance is looking for a quick fix or a shortcut so it can just get on with it. Superficial repentance has an attitude of this change is enough rather than do whatever it takes, Lord. Superficial repentance believes God is pleased and or fooled by wearing this mask of superficiality. The problem in our hearts when we do this is our desire to appear is greater than our desire to be. We're either appearing better for ourselves, for when we look in the mirror, or for someone, or for some group, or for some something. But our desire to appear is greater than our desire to be. Superficial repentance, such ones are the monkeys with their hand caught in the gourd, trapped by what we won't let go of. Such ones are too attached to the world and its ways to trust and surrender more. Such ones keep up appearances and pretend, but their hearts are growing harder every day. In reality, such ones are defiant, indifferent, callous, and complacent toward holiness. Superficial repentance from Zephaniah not something we want to be messing with. The bottom line, pretenders will be exposed and disciplined. When the sinner won't offer himself to God as a living sacrifice, he'll instead become the sacrifice for and victim of his own sin. Remember when we were in Roman when when we were in um, Joshua and we did Romans five six seven and eight and Romans six twenty three you've all committed it to memory as part of the road of salvation and you remember what it said the wages of sin is death the wages of sin is still death for you and for me the wages of sin is still death that has not changed. Now, the Lord has rescued us from the ultimate problem there, but sin is still all about death and destruction and badness. (laughs) Sin has not gotten better. Sin is still just as bad as it was. But those who repent will be shown mercy, will be restored by the Lord. You also know 1 John 1, 9. And you say, wow, I like it when we talk about grace a lot more. Uh, the Lord takes holiness very seriously. More seriously than I do. I hate to say. I am not here advocating works. I'm not saying you got saved by grace and now work really hard. That's not what I'm saying. You say, well, then, Bill, I'm very confused because I can't, oh, my English teachers would hate this. I can't not, 
sin. <laughs> right? I can't not sin. So what am I supposed to do? I got to work my way out of this. No. Do you remember the pile? You and I, every once in a while, think there's this giant pile of sin in between me and the Lord and a closer, more intimate relationship with the Lord. Giant pile. Now, for some reason, I think the Lord is on that side and I'm on this side. And he, he gave me a, it's probably a golden shovel, but he gave me a shovel. And he wants me to get to work and to start digging. And to get rid of these sins, because otherwise I can't get to him. Nothing could be further from the truth. Remember we talked, he walks around to this side of the pile. And with me, he says, Bill, you'll never make any progress <laughs> by yourself. Let me help you. Because only then will we make progress. And so then he and I begin shoveling together. And amazingly, things change. I'm not working to gain or improve my relationship with the Lord. In fact, as we talked then, the Spirit of God living in you is the only person who can defeat sin. I can't defeat sin. Never have been able to. I'm not a, a Christian superman. I'm just as helpless against sin as you are. Our only help is the Holy Spirit sent by the Lord Jesus to help us. And he begins digging. So what am I supposed to do? When the speed limit in my heart is still too high <laughs> and I still drive too fast and I get pulled over and I get a ticket and I go, oh, Never again will this happen. Never again. <laughs> and I, through an act of my will, I say, this will never happen again until tomorrow <laughs> when there's good reason for me to be speeding. Because my will cannot overcome sin. What can? <laughs> Who can? <laughs> the Holy Spirit of God. Lord, I sinned again. I know, Bill. I'm not surprised. <laughs> You're not home yet. Will you come help me again? I'd love to. I know it's the same sin we did yesterday. It's okay, Bill. It's okay. I'd love to help you with that. Don't let a works lie get in between you and your relationship with the Lord. It's just not true. And apart from him, doesn't Jesus say something like this? You can do a little, a lot, oh yeah, nothing. Do you understand nothing? I struggle to understand nothing. <laughs> so I don't believe the Lord because I keep trying. So what do I have to do? Lord, sorry, I didn't believe you yesterday. And so when somebody comes up to you and you says, I I'm struggling with doubt and with belief. Yeah, me too. It's happened to me this morning. Somebody walked up and they said, I'm really struggling. A bad thing has happened to someone I know and love and I'm struggling. And I said, yeah, I struggle too. Does the elder board know? <laughs> and I said, uh-huh, and they struggle too. Have you ever questioned God? Yeah. Ever been angry at God? Guess what? He already knows. It's not like you're hiding something from him. <laughs> Bill, I didn't remember that you'd questioned me ever. <laughs> He's not fooled. He's not deceived. He knows everything all the way down to the motives of my heart. I think I might be doing something for all the right reasons. Turns out I wasn't. 
But if you start thinking that you're on one side of a pile of sins and the Lord is on the other and you've got to dig your way back to him, you'll never make it. And you get frustrated and give up. We need the Lord. We need the Lord to come work on our behalf. To say, Daddy, I dropped the ball again. I know, son. It's all right. It's all right. We got to work at that one, though. You know, we can't just blow it off. <laughs> we got to start working on it. Okay, okay. But I can only do it with your help. I know. You ready? Mm mm. <laughs> Here we go. Until tomorrow when I fail again. We we're talking about before, one of my favorite verses is, um, shows up all over the Old Testament. Um, but it is the Lord. How, how, when Moses says, Lord, tell me who you are or show me who you are, the Lord gives him this. He says, the Lord, the Lord, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. That's how the Lord describes himself. Compassionate, merciful, compassionate, merciful. Gracious, merciful, gracious, slow to anger. Oh, I don't believe that one. And abounding in loving kindness. I can let somebody mess up a couple of times, then after that, ooh, <laughs> they'd better not mess up again. The Lord is not that way. He is amazing. And every time we go, he says, Let's get back in the game. Question. Is your heart cold, lukewarm, or hot toward the Lord, his word, and his worship today? Do you have a Sunday-only relationship? Where have you grown weary of walking with the Lord and obeying him? Does your lifestyle, speech, actions, attitudes magnify the Lord or do, does it instead disgrace his name in front of others? Second big application I think we can get from Zephaniah is the faithful worship while they wait on God. Remember the whole second, the, it was a small part, but the second section of Zephaniah is about rejoicing and worshiping in the Lord's presence. So the faithful worship while they wait on God. What are the Zephaniahs and the Jeremiahs to do in the midst of going off to Babylon? They're to worship while they wait on the Lord. Worship while we wait. Focus on God's timeless character over our present day suffering. Worship him for who he is. And you could add a thousand more to these. He's an all-powerful savior. He's, he'll always be with you and never forsake you. He's compassionate and merciful to the humble. He's the protector of the weak and of those who wait and depend on him. He is faithful and just. And you could make, keep your list going. We can worship God always for who he is, not our present circumstances. You can pray the Psalms, sing hymns or spiritual songs to yourself as Paul counseled in Ephesians chapter 5. Have hope because God is faithful to do what he says he'll do. One day he'll turn your day of suffering into a day of joy. Continue to walk in the light with him while you're waiting and wait on him to do his good work. Worship while we wait. Encourage one another in these truths. Because something I've learned, something you all have learned too, every believer is fighting some battle every day 
that you may know nothing about. Every believer is fighting some battle every day that you may not know anything about, but they are battling it. And so we need to encourage one another. We need to worship together, encourage one another, and wait patiently together, maybe in a home group. Maybe you've got two or three close friends or couples that you hang out with, and you encourage each other in this these truths. Tonight, Zephaniah would remind us true repentance can be recognized by a new obedience in the opposite direction and the faithful worship while they wait on God. For next time, Jeremiah 1 to 33. Do not leave it for Sunday at 4 o'clock. You will lose. (laughs) Let me pray for us. Oh, Father, three chapters that uh, penetrate deeply uh, into my own heart. I thank you for your word. It shows me, reminds me, tells me, instructs me again about who you are and does the same about showing me who I am. And every day, I need a Savior. Thank you for your Son, our Lord Jesus, for his finished work on the cross, for the peace, the security, the safety that that gives us in our relationship with you, including the safety and the security of saying to you, Daddy, we blew it again, and be able to tell you what we know you already know, but we are so slow to tell you. I thank you for your great patience, your great unfailing love toward us. We love you. We thank you. We're so glad you loved us first, and you take care of us in an unrivaled way. Thank you. I'm going to pray for a blessing this week from you and from your word as we look at it and read it and pray over it uh, in preparation for next week. Please, would you do that? And we ask you in Jesus' name, amen. See you in a week.